and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast on the internet folded up to select six movies all related to a single theme, and then take each of those movies and give them their own episode where we discuss how and why the movie was made, followed by a full review of the movie by me, Chad Cooper, my lifelong friend, Mr. Mo Ransom. <gasps> that's right, we're the only podcast on the internet that's just like that, and you're lucky enough to have found it. This season's theme is Die Hard Ons, featuring six movies that are all rip-offs of the classic action film Die Hard. Other titles considered for this season included Die Hard Over, Die Hardest, Die Hardy Har Har, Die Hard Days Night, Die Hardy Boys, Die Hardly Knew Em, Die Hard Act to Follow, Die Hard Cheddar, Die Hard Knocks, Die Hard Hearing, Die Hard Liquor, Die Harder They Come, Die Harder They Fall, Die Hard Ball, Die Hard Balls, Die Hard Offs, but we settled on Die Hard Ons. This is episode five, featuring the film Passenger 57, starring Wesley Snipes and a county fair. It's got a heap and helping of racism for modern day discomfort. There's lots of 90s era saxophone and there's martial arts. Also, did I mention that the movie takes place in both Florida and Louisiana? Ho <laughs> ho I've got your attention now, don't I? Well, let's not waste any more time getting y'all hot and bothered under the collar, teasing this classic diehard ripoff that takes place high up in the sky. Well, except for the majority of the movie that's planted on terra firma next to a redneck heckling you as you try to throw softballs at a bullseye in hopes of dropping this loudmouth jerk into a see-through tank full of piss-tainted water. Boo! Get in here and give these fine folks some background on the motion picture Passenger 57. Oh, what if we called this season Shitty Die Hard Ripoffs? Is that too on the nose? Die Try Harder? You know? Maybe we do a terrible sequel to this season. Got that? Huh? <laughs> I love wordplay. One of the best things about doing a whole season about Die Hard ripoffs is that it offers the opportunity to talk about some great criminal masterminds. Earlier in the season, we talked about the great train robbery, but now it is time to turn our attention to something with some altitude. This episode, we are going to talk about the greatest airborne crime of all time. There is but one unsolved case of air piracy, and if there are two cooler words to put together in the English language, I'm unaware of what they are. And of course, we're talking about the mid-air hijacking by the man known as D.B. Cooper. Here are the facts of the case, and they are undisputed. The day before Thanksgiving, 1971, November 24th, as it happened, a passenger using the name Dan Cooper boarded Northwest Orient Airlines at Portland International Airport, a quick hop of a flight to the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. His only luggage was a black attache case. Dan Cooper ordered a drink, a bourbon and soda, then slipped a note to the flight attendant, Florence Schaffner. Schaffner believed the note to be Cooper's phone number and slipped it into her purse without reading it. Cooper leaned forward to the flight attendant, who was seated in the jump seat in front of him, and said, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. What the note said is lost to time as Cooper took the note back from Schaffner, but as she tells it, the note said Cooper had a bomb and asked her to take the seat beside him. She did, but worried that the whole thing might be a put-on, Schaffner asked to see the bomb. Cooper complied, opening the attache case to show off what she believed to be dynamite inside, along with wires and maybe a battery or a detonator. Convinced that this was not in fact a put-on, Cooper gave Schaffner his demands. He wanted $200,000, or about $1.3 million in today's money, four parachutes, and a fuel truck waiting in Seattle to gas up the plane. He released Schaffner from her seat beside him, and she went to the cockpit and told the pilots, who in turn radioed Seattle-Tacoma International Air Traffic Control. As things ran up the chain of command, the president of Northwest Orient Airlines approved the release of money to the man who called himself Cooper, and who had now slipped on some cool sunglasses, according to Schaffner, and the president also told all the staff to comply with any of Cooper's demands. Another of the flight attendants, Tina Mucklow, provided some more detail on Cooper. 
He was familiar with the area, she knew, based on his ability to identify Tacoma from the air and having a working knowledge of the drive distance between the Tacoma Airport and the local McCord Air Force Base. She also added, quote, He seemed rather nice. He was thoughtful and calm all the time. He even ordered a second drink and paid his tab. He asked that the flight crew get meals in Seattle when they landed. He told Mucklow, I don't have a grudge against your airline, miss. I just have a grudge. Citing a minor mechanical difficulty, the pilot told the other 35 passengers on the flight that landing would be delayed, and they circled for about two hours until the FBI had time to get the money and parachutes for Cooper. There were $10,020 bills, and the FBI took pictures of all of them. The parachutes came from a local skydiving school. And then the plane landed in Seattle, and good as his word, the passengers were released. Before they landed, Cooper had the windows drawn to discourage snipers, and then he met an operations manager for Northwest Orient at the aft stairs, where he received his duffel bag full of money and the parachutes. Along with the other passengers, flight attendant Schaffner also left the plane. The refueling took longer than Cooper expected, and he became agitated for the first time, sending a note to the cockpit stating, Let's get this show on the road. The refueling was complete, and the plane took off with a new flight plan and some specific instructions. They would fly towards Mexico City with the landing gear down, and the cabin would remain unpressurized. When the crew informed Cooper that the plane would never make it to Mexico City with the current fuel, a stop in Reno was agreed upon. Cooper also wanted the plane to take off with the stairs extended, but was talked out of it by the Northwest Orient officials, who explained that could lead to a crash. So he asked Tina Mucklow how to operate the stairs once they were airborne. The plane was in the air around 7.40 p.m., trailed by two F-106 fighters from McCord Air Force Base though Cooper never saw those. The hijacker told Mucklow to move up to the cockpit and to keep the curtain closed. 20 minutes after takeoff, the cockpit saw a warning light appear, indicating the rear stairs were being lowered. At approximately 8.13, the crew had to adjust for a sudden upward movement and then continued on to Reno. Upon landing, they discovered Cooper was gone and the FBI swept the plane and found no trace of the attaché either. D.B. Cooper, the bomb, and $200,000 had vanished. In the wake of the disappearance, authorities converged on the plane to get as much evidence as possible. Fingerprints were found, though no match was ever made. Cooper's clip-on tie and the tie clip were there along with two of the unused parachutes, though Cooper had disabled those by cutting some of the lines to the canopy of the chutes. A description of Cooper was cobbled together by eyewitnesses, resulting in the composite drawing you may have seen, a narrow-faced man with sunglasses, a face that could be just about any middle-aged white guy. A man in Oregon was questioned by police thanks to a criminal record and the fact that his name was D.B. Cooper. While the man in question was cleared of all suspicion, his name stuck. The man who bought a ticket for that flight and leaped from the back of a plane never called himself D.B. Cooper, only Dan. But the reporter confused the two in his story and the report went wide on the wire services, cementing the hijacker's name as D.B. Cooper. Specialists then went to work simulating Cooper's jump in an attempt to get some idea of where Cooper might have landed. The area near Mount St. Helens was generally considered a good place to start looking, and when air and foot searches of that area didn't yield anything, the hunt widened to every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, henhouse, outhouse, and doghouse in that area. There were dogs, and I kid you not, submarines used in the search, but after all the effort from everyone from the FBI to local wackos, not a stitch of evidence was ever found. As if some higher power decided D.B. Cooper was meant for myth, when the pilot came forward years later and said that the flight plan used to simulate the drop zone was inaccurate and D.B. Cooper likely landed further southeast, what traces might have been there were obscured when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, covering the whole area with ash. Way back in 2016, 
the FBI finally announced they were suspending the investigation and opened all evidence to the public. All 66 volumes of it accumulated over 45 years. That's not to say we have no clues as to what happened. In 1978, a placard with instructions on how to lower the stairs of a plane like the one Cooper was on was found near a logging road, suggesting that perhaps Cooper survived the jump. In 1980, an eight-year-old kid found three bundles of eroded bills that were later confirmed to be part of the ransom given to Cooper. The weird part was, geologists suggested that the money would have had to enter the water several months after the hijacking to wash up at that time and in that condition, raising as many questions as these bundles answered. Those bills were eventually auctioned off as relics of this great mystery. A group of citizen sleuths brought a new theory to bear after they examined the recovered tie using high-intensity microscopes and found rare earth minerals on the tie. That suggested Cooper might have been an employee of Boeing, who used such materials which were more rare in 1971 than in later years, but this led to no real suspects. Another anecdotal bit of evidence is found in the alias the hijacker used. It is possible the name Dan Cooper was lifted from a Belgian comic series which followed the exploits of one Dan Cooper, Canadian Air Force pilot who was known to parachute into and out of danger. Such a reference would suggest some military experience or certainly a working knowledge of Belgian comics. What the FBI believed from the beginning, though, was that whoever this man was who called himself D.B. Cooper is this. The odds of Cooper ever surviving the jump were very low. The hijacker likely died in the jump. There was no indication Cooper was a trained paratrooper, a specialist who likely would never have attempted such a risky jump. It was dark, it was raining, the wind chill was dangerous, and the hijacker jumped, without a helmet mind you, into terrain that would have been difficult to survive with the onset of winter in the clothes Cooper wore. He would have needed an accomplice either on the aircraft or below, and no one has ever been proved to have helped Cooper. The most likely scenario is that the man known as D.B. Cooper leaped to his death from the back of that plane, swallowed by the wilds of the landscape, never to be seen again. But, but there is a chance. And that's what makes the mystery of D.B. Cooper so compelling. What if, one asks themselves, Cooper did get away? What if he survived and trudged down some logging road with the duffel full of money, less a few lost bundles, and went on to live his life in much better financial terms and with the knowledge that he had pulled off the perfect crime? There's an excellent documentary called The Mystery of D.B. Cooper from 2020 I hardly recommend, which suggests four potential suspects. But what the documentary ultimately proposes is that it doesn't really matter who Cooper was. It's the story, the myth, that matters. Until some skeleton is discovered suspended in a tree by a parachute, or some other proof is discovered, Cooper will be immortal. A note, an attache case, a duffel bag full of money, and a parachute. Those are the ingredients to infamy. But let's get to a less mysterious airborne heist and solve the mystery of how a movie like Passenger 57 happened. When it comes to making Passenger 57, Wesley Snipes was not the first choice. And it wasn't a cool British adjacent villain with a penchant for timekeeping our hero was up against. The original script was from writer Stuart Raffel, who wrote such 80s landmarks as War Games and the Ice Pirates, as well as Mannequin 2 on the Move. He also wrote Tammy and the T-Rex, which is on the shortlist for this show somewhere down the line. Raffel's script began as a much more overt tale of terrorism, with a lead like Clint Eastwood in mind. The premise goes like this. The hero would be on a plane to Spain, where he will bury his son. Little does he know that the Iranian gentleman in the seat next to him is a terrorist. The terrorist takes over the plane and forces it to land in Iran, but our hero being the wily protagonist that he is, escapes the plane in Iran. He then goes to capture some mullahs, which are revered and powerful religious figures in that country, and negotiates for a trade for the American hostages. Now you might hear that and think, 
why would they change any of that? It sounds exciting, and nothing makes a hero more heroic than the taking of hostages. But according to Raphael, the head of a studio came to him after reading the script and said, if I make that movie, they'll blow up the theaters. And so the script was rewritten, and then rewritten again, until it ultimately became a vehicle for the up-and-coming Wesley Snipes. Raphael says only a little bit of his original script remains, but the title sure did. When he was asked why the movie was called Passenger 57, he said it came from the wellspring of all good ideas, a bottle of ketchup. He was trying to come up with a title for his sensitive portrayal of terrorism, happened upon a bottle of Heinz ketchup, and bada bing bada boom, you got yourself a title. That's the kind of creativity you can expect from the writer of the Sci-Fi Channel original film, Croc. The main credit with the screenplay is David Lowry, who is perhaps best known as the writer of the much maligned Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, which is not a very good movie by any measure. But he also wrote Dreamscape, and that movie is kind of great, so it all comes out in the wash, I guess. When it came to casting, the usual action heroes were offered the lead. Sylvester Stallone turned the movie down, but his refusal did inspire the change of name to one of the characters in the movie to Sly Del Vecchio. While Tom Sizemore would eventually take that part, it was also offered to Tom Sizemore alike, Michael Madsen. Pick 6 alum Steven Seagal was also offered the lead, but he turned it down to do a little movie called Under Siege, maybe you've heard of it, which launched his career to a new level. Football player turned action star Brian Bosworth was tapped, but he had to refuse, thanks to a surgery following a career-ending injury. And once the movie shifted from being a regular white guy diehard ripoff to a black guy diehard ripoff, actors Denzel Washington and Eddie Murphy were also given the script, but neither of them took the bait. Although one wonders how this might have been better as an action comedy role for Eddie Murphy. Oh, life and death, the days that are no more. But Wesley Snipes, of course, did take on the role of Cutter for the film. Snipes was on his way when Passenger 57 came to him. He'd gotten some recognition from roles in the Goldie Hawn comedy Wildcats and another sports comedy, Major League, where he played Willie Mays Hayes. The big break came with his turn in New Jack City and then Spike Lee's Jungle Fever. One role at a time, Snipes was making a name for himself. He was a theater and dance kid who also had a background in martial arts. All the ingredients of an action star, really. While he moved to the Bronx, Wesley Snipes' hometown was Orlando, Florida, where much of Passenger 57 was filmed, doubling for its Louisiana setting. While he was there, he spoke at his old high school and gave paid extra roles to the kids with good grades. A lot of them show up in that carnival scene. With his physicality, Snipes liked doing his own stunts where he could, and along with his villainous co-star Bruce Payne, they decided to do the final fight scene themselves. Payne had recently been considered for the role of Batman in the 1989 blockbuster, but never quite found his rocket to success. Still, the guy has worked professionally and steadily for almost 40 years, so hard to argue with that kind of success. His scrap with Snipes in the conclusion of this movie shows he had some action movie chops too. With an estimated budget of $15 million, Passenger 57 opened in November of 1992 and hit number one in its first week, toppling under siege from the number one spot as fate would have it. It went on to make almost $70 million worldwide and helped make Snipes a real action hero. The movie was largely panned by critics on its release. Most of the criticism came from lackluster action scenes and the obvious nods to other better movies like Die Hard. But both Wesley Snipes and Bruce Payne got passes for being a charismatic hero and villain duo. One final note on the movie before we get chat in here. The movie was slated to air on the Stars Channel almost 10 years after its release. Just a random action film to fill the schedule. Only that random schedule had Passenger 57 appearing on television on the night of September 11th, 2001. Stars naturally pulled the movie from the schedule. But enough learning, let's get to some burning. Time to bring Chad in for a takeoff into the snarky skies. Ladies and gentlemen, cutters and reins, it's 1992's Passenger 57. Hey 
there, and welcome to what uh, what turns out to be the penultimate episode of Season 19 of Pick 6 Movies. I, of course, am one of your hosts, Bo, and with me as ever is the lovely, the talented, the the kung fu martial arts champion, Chad Cooper. Hiya! Yeah, that's... <laughs> I, I don't know that there's any better way to prove that you are a <laughs> kung fu martial arts champion than yelling hiya like drunken master. <laughs> but... Of course, this season is is called Die Hard On. It's been all about Die Hard ripoffs, mm -hmm. and so we find ourselves washed up on the shores of <laughs> Louisiana, you know, Orlando, Louisiana, or Miami. Folks. Yeah, it, or... a lot of this was filmed in Orlando uh, because that's where Wesley Snipes lived. I don't think that's why, but I think it didn't hurt. And in fact, I just to reiterate uh, something that I'm sure is going to show up in the introduction to this. It was basically like a school lottery where a bunch of kids from a school that he attended, if they had really high grades and good marks and all that kind of thing, they got to be some of the kids in that fairground scene at the end of this movie. And, you know... I guess that's something for education. I mean, the rewards for education are so slim in this country anyway. I'll take a personal pan pizza for pretending to read a book any day. I don't know, man. Being able to say, like, I was the kid that got shoved <laughs> out of the way in Passenger 57. Not bad. But yeah, so this is Passenger 57. It's uh, Wesley Snipes, one of his early action roles. Uh-huh. And it is as diehard a ripoff as you could want. I think this could also fall into a season of movies that ripped off the Rambo series. But I'll touch on that a little later. Okay. The one thing I will say about this, just in the upfront, before we talk about anything else, I like Wesley Snipes a lot. I'm a big fan of, uh, especially that first Blade movie. I think he's really, really entertaining. He's a charming guy and actually knows some martial arts. And I'm not saying that this movie is a martial arts extravaganza, but I like the fact that he seems to be at least confident in what he is doing. <laughs> Especially compared to something like Under Siege 2, where I know that Steven Seagal like had all these martial arts schools and that kind of thing, uh -huh. but it all looks made up when he does it. But there's like a moment in this movie where Wesley Snipes like blocks a dude's punch with his knee and then kicks him in the face. And mm -hmm. like, that looks like a thing that people might do as opposed to Steven Seagal grabbing a guy's pinky and pulling it backward. And he's like, owie, ow, 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 ow. <laughs> right. Like, oh, I'm going to give you noogies sure this movie would not be on this show if it were really good but as far as some of the diehard movies that we've covered not the worst it, it's got some moves the only wesley snipes movies i remember seeing are white man can jump to wong fu i remember seeing him in rising sun because i'd read that michael Crichton novel and mm -hmm. that was unexpected casting in that film yeah i never saw any of the blade movies Oh, the just, first Blade's real good. I, I'll take your word for that. Uh -huh. And then he's popped up here and there recently in some smaller cameo roles. But, you know, to your point, I, I, I got nothing against him. He was never really a big draw for me. And in a movie like this, it's kind of paint by numbers because it's a diehard knockoff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd never seen this movie until recently when you pitched it as an episode. So it was new to me. All right. I'll tell you the key Wesley Snipes movies if you want to really fall in love with this guy. All right, let me throw away my pen so I can't write these down. Obviously, New Jack City is Oh, fantastic. wait, I have seen New Jack City. Right. I forgot about that one. Okay. And uh, Demolition Man. He's great. Did in I see that? It He's great in Demolition Man. I don't think I saw that, but I worked in a bar that had the pinball machine, so I feel like I got the gist of the movie. I can't believe you. That is a movie that will definitely pop up on this show at some point, <laughs> because it's not good exactly, but it's kind of amazing. And he plays a character named Simon Phoenix, and when he kills somebody, he'll say uh, little quippy lines like, Caca! Caca! Simon says, die. It's all right. <laughs> it sounds great <laughs> for, for this show. <laughs> it is one of the weirder Sylvester Stallone performances as well. Ooh. And a return of Sandra Bullock. All right, ladies and gentlemen, much like Elvis Costello waving off in his <laughs> Saturday Night Live appearance and then pivoting to Radio Radio, it turns out this episode is going to be just nothing but Demolition Man. <laughs> oh, God. And I know that you haven't seen it, but that's okay. Just sit down and relax. So what happens is Sylvester Stallone... 
alone. I'll, I'll just giggle and go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to save uh, an entire building of school children from Simon Phoenix, who has the whole building rigged to blow. But before he can save all these children, Simon Phoenix sets off the bomb, and then he gets put in suspended animation. Because, I don't know, I guess he's somehow responsible for the death of all these children? So Sylvester Stallone then goes into the future <laughs> like Buck Rogers. All of this is exactly what happens in Demolition Man. Oh, you know what? That's why they had a naked Sylvester Stallone in all those Planet Hollywoods. That was from that movie, Yeah, right? oh, yeah. He's all curled up in the fetal position. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Carved out of stone. That son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, just a, a little, we'll put a pen in that because we will definitely circle back to Demolition Man. But the, the, Sylvester Stallone, not in this movie. No. Much the worse for it. There is a character named Sly, but we're not going to talk about him because he's played by Michael Madsen and that's all I know him as. Tom Sizemore. Sorry, Tom Sizemore. It's a direct reference to Sylvester Stallone who was originally offered the part in this movie. And he said no? <laughs> yeah, he was like, look, uh, I think I'm just going to go hang out on a mountain or something. I don't know. All this flying and going to a carnivals? No, thank you. <laughs> anyway, let's get into this thing. It has one of the things you love best, which is a really long opening credit sequence. Yes, it does. Way too long of an opening credit sequence. It's almost like a James Bond type opening, but instead of sexy women silhouettes, we get like these duotone contents of some beat up backpack belonging to a guy who's peddling dime bags circa 1995. The music is great. There's a, a lot of funky bass. Yeah. It's all of that. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's it's that Lethal Weapon 2 era of music, even though I think Lethal Weapon 2 preceded this by a number of years. But it's that kind of thing of like, let's have some crazy saxophone and some funky bass yeah. in our soundtrack. It's the kind of music that you would hear like in a 90s movie where a tough as nails cop, he's going through like a filing cabinet with a pin flashlight clenched beneath his teeth. And then like a Rottweiler comes around the corner at the last minute and chases after him and gets away yeah he has to <laughs> go over a fence yeah absolutely this is all x-ray footage of things like keys and a comb and cassette tapes and roach clips and there's an id for a british citizen named charles rain uh-huh who is portrayed by actor bruce payne charles rain is portrayed by Actor Bruce Payne by George Hiscotic. Mine is, is the old, like, uh, Albanian's pain comes mainly from Homani. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Bruce Payne played Charles Rain. <laughs> and where does our movie take place? On a plane! On a plane! <laughs> That's it! This movie is exactly one narrator away from being a Gilbert and Sullivan musical. <laughs> so you kind of close the credits with this tight shot of his ID so you get a, a, a cold look into the eyes of international terrorist Charles Rain mm -hmm. and then you fade up into a hospital room where international terrorist Charles Rain is about to get some plastic surgery like it's one of those illicit surgeries, you know, where he's paying a whole lot of money to change his appearance and whatnot. I thought he was at the dentist office at first. It did not look like an operating room to me. No. <laughs> also, why is Charles Rain wearing doctor scrubs? He looks like everybody else in the room. I don't think it's normal for a patient to be dressed like one of the people performing surgery or, I don't know, a teeth cleaning. Well, Chad, in the novelization of Passenger 57... Uh -huh. And uh, which may or may, may not exist, and I'm totally making up right now. But <laughs> the way they snuck him into the room is that they dressed him up like a doctor and then brought him into the room where there was no surgery scheduled. Oh, this doctor does come in. Or maybe he's also a patient. Who knows in this film? <laughs> and this possible doctor says, uh, Mr. Rain, would you like to have one last look at your face? And Charles Rain says, I never live in the past. And then this anesthesiologist <laughs> leans in with a mask for Charles Rain's face. And he grabs her hand and he says, no, thank you. He's got such good manners, this one, with his pleases and thank yous. And the doctor is like, well, don't you want something for the pain? And he says, there will be no pain. And the doctor's like, all right, fuck it. <laughs> I get paid either way. Right. No skin off my nose, man. I mean, it's all skin <laughs> off yours. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And while this guy is making no inroads with the people about to start carving up his face, we get a cutaway to a bunch of police cars and SWAT vans and all kinds 
of stuff headed to their location. Uh huh. And then we cut back to the <laughs> surgical arena where Rain notices that the doctor keeps checking the clock as he's prepping the surgery and whatnot. And then we're getting some cut back and forth, and like some FBI meathead is like, all right, this guy keeps changing his face. If we screw this right up, we're never going to get another chance. So Charles Rain has had multiple cosmetic surgeries. Mm -hmm. And whatever they're about to do in this butcher shop will be so intense that once complete, no law enforcement will ever be able to find. It. That's right. It's much like the surgery scene from the Batman 89 where the Joker sees himself for the first time. Give me the mirror. <laughs> we go back to the surgery dentist office and Rain <laughs> looks up at the doctor and he says, tell me, doctor, what time is it? And he says, it's time for you to get a watch. Burn. <laughs> he does this a couple of times. And I don't know if it's just his signature, like Sam Jackson rattling uh -huh. off that made up biblical passage or whatever. But he uh, just d decides at this point, oh, apparently this doctor is in on some conspiracy to get me arrested. That wasn't my read. My read was that he knew the cops were busting in at noon and he was just waiting for his time to make his escape i didn't think the doctor was in on it but otherwise why would the doctor be looking at the clock all suspicious like he's good at time management he's got to start the surgery at noon he's got to be out by two he's on the links by three right he's got to tee off later that afternoon so <laughs> he's gonna be at the 19th hole by five right he's gonna call his wife at six and say he has an emergency surgery and then he's gonna <laughs> go hook up with his mistress i'm now more interested in the story of this doctor than i have anything that that happens in passenger 57 <laughs> well sadly charles rain jumps up grabs the scalpel from this possible doctor patient and he just slits his throat kills him mm. and the swat team is busted into the operating room it's chaos bo and then charles rain he runs down the hallway as fast as he can go and then ding the elevator opens up and a bunch of SWAT team members who are too lazy to take the stairs, they just pop out and immediately just start spraying bullets. Brrr. They are there to kill him or someone else. If you're gonna accidentally shoot a civilian, Chad, what better place than a hospital? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> the amount of harm they could possibly do was slightly <laughs> lower in this scenario. But you're right. They come Clean out Clean up fire. on aisle five. Yeah. Oh, boy. Get them down to room seven. Oh, that, that's brains. Uh, somebody get one of them bedpans. See if you can scoop some of that stuff up. Take it down with them. Put it on ice. Charles Rain, he runs down this separate hallway, and he just leaps through what appears to be a very sturdy window pane. He crashes down on a sun umbrella at an outdoor cafe which breaks his fall of no less than like five stories mm -hmm. this man would be dead Bo, or severely incapable of movement well he's all jacked up on not gas and see that earlier when he said he didn't want anything for the pain i thought maybe he had one of those weird movie make -em up conditions where he's incapable of feeling any sort of i don't know oh uh, yeah like, like one of those james bond scenarios it, because of some genetic accident he is incapable of feeling pain and therefore it makes him stronger yeah some shit like that but that never really happens he just miraculously goes crashing out this window and you know lands around let me also say that charles rain in our movie he's got this really really dirty mullet it's very uncapped it's kind of like he is to matthew mcconaughey what jim belushi was to john belushi like they mm. kind of look similar but it's clearly not the original there's a whiff of the hard target Van Damme haircut in this. It's a weird mullet. It's almost like a comb over, but instead of going side to side, it's front to back. Yeah. And it's hiding a bald spot all the way down to his shoulders. Right. One might almost call it Trump-esque in, it, in its elaborate use of trying to both disguise a thing and decorate a thing simultaneously. Yeah. A high degree of hair salon difficulty when this guy walks in. There are wings on it like when you get a front view it it fans out yeah it's it's a something all right from the back it's all waterfall it's just a real something so he gets away yeah he's gone racing through the city streets there's right. a great shot of him just shoving one dude brutally out of his way that i really like yeah and then a truck containing a bunch of those office water cooler bottles does a little side swipe and then it spills water everywhere and that blocks charles rain's 
getaway and yeah. he's eventually surrounded by police and bada bing bada boom charles rain has been apprehended nice job boys and eh, thanks to you too water bottles <laughs> spilling all over the road a water truck is really what catches this guy yeah it certainly gets the assist if you're doing the <laughs> the scorecard at home so our movie cuts to an airplane uh-huh with a lot of 90s era cliches of fashion and hairstyles aboard. And we meet a stewardess, or flight attendant as she prefers to be called. Her name is Marty, with an I, walking along. And then we see our movie's hero beau, Wesley Snipes. And he's sitting in the aisle seat of two seats on the right, leaving the open seat next to the window. Which, if I was him, beau, I would take the window seat because, one, I like to look outside and see if I can spot UFOs. Mm -hmm. And two, if I'm on the aisle seat, I'm always afraid I might get crop dusted by somebody on the the plane with a nervous stomach <laughs> i am a window seat person myself but i appreciate if you're going to conduct acts of terrorism and i'm not saying you should i'm saying no. if you do then aisle seat is where you belong it's just the freest range of motion <laughs> marty's wandering around this plane and wesley snipes gets up he goes to first class where he pulls out a gun bo uh -huh. and he takes marty hostage with a hey baby nobody moves nobody gets hurt you got the keys to the flight deck nice and slow don't make me use this and marty just elbows wesley snipes in the gut she spikes his foot with her high heel and a different passenger grabs wesley snipes gun and wesley snipes shouts out hey baby turn it off turn it off because there is a camera filming all of this it pans back and we see there's a guy videotaping all this and we are at flight attendant training school and we're in one of those half a fuselages that are used to make movies like this and wesley snipes is beside himself angry about all of this even though the, the he was disarmed as the terrorist, but he's like, hey, baby, what do you think you were doing there? And she says, well, I was saving the day. I was using improvised anti-terrorism tactics. And he says, listen, baby, if that had been real, you would have gotten your head blown off. You need to follow instructions. And she's like, I don't have to take this from some former security specialist. He's like, oh, 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 oh. I'm not a former security specialist, baby. I'm the real deal. Hey, baby, if this had been a real gun and you had pulled that Angie Dickinson bullshit you just pulled, you would have got your head blown off. And all these passengers killed i was like first off that's belittling the work of angie dickinson in her groundbreaking role of policewoman in the 1970s but she was 42 when she starred in that series about an empowered female police officer so get the good name of angie dickinson out of your mouth wesley snipes at passenger 57 he wouldn't have said that about pam greer well pam greer you think pam greer would have just let a terrorist put a gun to her head no she would have elbowed him in the gut stabbed him in the foot with her high heel marty channeling foxy brown <laughs> Poor policewoman. Tom Sizemore, before the troubles, shows up in this movie. Boy, talk about a career. Really went downhill. Here's the thing. Watching this movie was a nice reminder of how good and interesting an actor Tom Sizemore was before the bottle took hold. Didn't he get involved with, like, illegal sex stuff, too? Probably, but I think the booze and some other illegal substances are what led to that those were precedents yeah yeah to, to other other felonies yeah because nobody ever said i would have made better decisions if i'd been drunk and that's <laughs> tom Sizemore's problem and much like michael madsen the but they're kind of of the same cloth in the sense that they both had these really promising careers and then just nosedived because of substance abuse problems and it's really unfortunate because they're both good you know i watched mm. those kill bill movies just recently and michael madsen it's it kind of heartbreaking because you see the future that could have been ahead of him, but then you realize like, oh, he's just doomed to a bunch of bad B movies. This is, hand to God, this is true. A script I had written is getting kind of shopped around right now, and they're trying to attach some talent to it and that kind of thing. And one of the names that came up was Michael Madsen because he does lower budget films. The problem with Michael Madsen is that you have to get a handler also, which is just somebody that you hire to make sure that he gets to and from the set without drunkenly running someone down right like you do with a bear very similar and i don't know that tom sizemore is in the handler category but it's the same kind of thing where you're like oh that is so sad because you're such a good actor what is wrong with people who make movies and television that you would hire that he's not that good he's not so good that it's like we're gonna hire this guy and we have to hire someone to wake him up drag him 
him to set <laughs> to be in movies. There are billions of people on planet Earth. You're telling me we can't find one person to play this gruff asshole? Right, but when you're trying to get money for a movie, you're looking for names that a producer might recognize. Even still, man. I don't disagree with you, but the reality of it is, hey, Michael Madsen is somebody that people have heard of, and so in some cases you're willing to- There are other him. people people have heard of, too. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That, that are raging alcoholics or sexual deviants or coked up wackadoos, which I'm not saying any of the people we've talked about are any of those things. I'm just, why would you do that? Because every actor is a coked up alcoholic wackadoo. That's just the sad reality of it. But why is that the only profession where you turn a blind eye to that? No one is like, Ernie's a hell of an accountant, but the problem is he's got a real bad coke problem. He doesn't come in work till two. He beats his wife. He's totaled cars. Too many to count. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, he makes the books clean. You mean like Tiger Woods? You know, <laughs> like it, it, acting isn't the only profession where it's allowed. It's just entertainment and famous people in general are kind of given more of a pass for that but to your point yes if you are just jim the mechanic yeah that <laughs> behavior is not going to be tolerated but if you are perceived to have some skill that other we, people we, don't we gotta have, hire jim he's the best at rebuilding starter motors but here's the problem you're gonna have to get a handler <laughs> right yeah <laughs> to make sure he gets to work and stay here all day to make sure he doesn't start any fights with his co-workers if we want to talk about the problems of late stage capitalism writ large, that's where we're headed. But yeah, anyway, so Tom Sizemore shows up, handler or not, and is like, hey, come on, pal. You got to take it easy on her. You know, she was just doing her job. You know, she reminds me of, she reminds me of that Lisa. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring that name up, but she really reminds me of Lisa. Sorry. Hey, I said it again. <laughs> yeah. Hey, by the way, I got a job that I think you might be interested in. I'm working for this new airline and uh, they needed somebody to come in and head up their counterterrorism unit. Like, what? What? Right. Here's the thing. This is the, the height of presumption, Chad. Not only is he offering this job to Wesley Snipes, he has set up a meeting mm -hmm. with the guy who owns this company. And it just says like, hey, Wesley Snipes, I hope you're going to show up because if you don't, I'm going to look like a real asshole. He goes on to say, look, I know you don't want the job, but you know what? Do me a solid and take it, you know, because I know how much Lisa meant. Ugh, dare I go again, bringing up that Lisa. All right, look, I know Lisa was important in your past and that's why you're so emotionally broken and distant, but come on, Wesley Snipes, take this job. Help me out. Come on, Wesley Snipes. The other thing that this sets up is a long string of scenes in this movie where Wesley Snipes is the most ungrateful friend in the history of friendships. Not only does he begrudgingly say he might be at this meeting if he has the time mm -hmm. at no point in this movie does he ever just look at his friend and say thanks thanks for being there when i was going through all this stuff with my wife who uh, our girlfriend or whoever lisa was i'm not sure that we get <laughs> we don't find... i think it's his wife no thanks for being a friend no thanks for helping me get this job no thanks for looking out for me and trying to get me back in the game none of that it is just constantly like, boy, I'll tell you what, Sly, if you get me in trouble one more time, I, I can't wait to take this job just so I can be here to make your life miserable, baby. And you're like, what <laughs> is Sly, a.k.a. Tom Sizemore, just the most masochistic friend on planet Earth where the only way he can get enjoyment out of this relationship is to have <laughs> a friend that is constantly cruel and dismissive of him? We cut to a prison that looks like it's on the set of Ernest Goes to Jail and Charles Rain <laughs> comes walking in, and he gets catcalled by all the other prisoners who want to have violent sex with him. Charles Rain makes his way into a cell where he meets his attorney, and this attorney says, hey, they're taking you to Los Angeles. You know, they got the death penalty there in California, and they have a witness that says you're responsible for two airline bombings in the past year. Boy, you sound like you're in trouble. <laughs> You should probably get a pretty good lawyer. I mean, uh, thank God you got me. So this attorney tells him, look, I got a great idea. I know that they've got this witness that can prove that you did at least two plane bombings. Right. But I think we can get you off if you claim insanity. And given your childhood, we think <laughs> we can make this stick. At which point, Rain grabs this attorney by the back of the head and cracks his skull in the table a couple of times. Yeah. And says, I told you never to mention my childhood. Now, mm -hmm. to prove that I am not insane, I'm going to put you in a chokehold. I want you to repeat the words, <laughs> Charles Rain is not insane. <laughs> 
Again, again. <laughs> there, now, tell my people to be ready. <laughs> to say it's nuts, I suppose, is to be putting a fine point on it, but it's one of those things where you're like, okay, I understand that he's the villain, and I like that you're teasing this, like, oh, he had this terrible childhood, and there's another reference to it later in the movie, but you never find out exactly what happened to him when he was a kid no they don't pay that off and they also don't have any resolution to wesley snipes lisa backstory yeah yeah that uh, we'll get to that but yes there is a <laughs> point where it's like why did you not do this thing to completely mirror the convenience source but, all right but speaking of well, the speaking of which yeah we fade to wesley snipes sitting shirtless with some incense burning he's in his apartment and he's got his fist wrapped in tape like he's gonna do some boxing exercises is that what they're called and he's sitting crisscross applesauce doing some meditation there's a lit candle it's kind of shit weirdos do can collect samurai swords you mm -hmm. know down in the basement of their aging mother's house and the movie fades to black and white and we get some footage where we're in this little bodega or mom and pop convenience store and wesley snipes is kissing on his wife slash girlfriend slash mistress one assumes this is the aforementioned lisa mm -hmm. and <laughs> As they're shopping through this convenience store, they're kind of teasing each other, like, hey, baby, what snacks you want me to get? And she's like, I don't know. I'd get some Pringles or something. You know, Pringles aren't really potato chips. They had to be advertised as potato crisps. You know, you can put two of them together and make a duck bill. I mean, that's, I know. that's my favorite thing. I still find it funny. I haven't advanced that much. <laughs> and a, a ne'er-do-well comes in off the streets. And says, Merry Christmas, motherfucker! Right, is <laughs> sticking the place up. Wesley Snipes pulls his gun. And when the thug sees this, he grabs Lisa uh -huh. and puts a gun to her head. Yeah. And at which point Wesley Snipes kind of raises his arms is like, hey, hey, it's cool, baby. You don't have to do anything. I'm not going to try to stop you. And the guy says, you shouldn't have tried before and shoots this woman in the fucking head. Yeah, he kills her. Yeah. And then he dashes out the front door and then Wesley Snipes shoots him multiple times and Wesley Snipes rushes over, picks up Lisa and what's left of the brains that were in her head and he just weeps openly holding his dying wife girlfriend mistress maybe around christmas time well one presumes either that or the guy holding the place up which was so cracked out he had no idea uh what <laughs> holiday merry holiday motherfucker so wesley snipes is officially emotionally scarred absolutely so in this scene wesley snipes does exactly as the bad guy instructed him mm -hmm. he grabs lisa as a hostage puts a gun to her head and then wesley snipes follows his instructions which if we go back to the training that he gave to marty with an eye early that's what he told her to do he was like if a terrorist takes you hostage you do everything he says so what is it it clearly didn't work here i think the implication is if he had never pulled the gun to begin with that if he had just capitulated from jump then she might still be alive oh. instead of oh i pulled the gun oops <laughs> sorry about that no you're in charge you're the man that maybe he would have not shot her but whatever then we cut to wesley snipes driving his fancy red corvette to this lunch that he is deigned to attend we get some nice smooth saxophone jazz here to, as well. Oh man, the the score to this movie is all right. I will stand by that. <laughs> and so he shows up to this lunch with Bruce Greenwood, the CEO of this airline, Atlantic International, Air National Atlantic, something like that. Bruce Greenwood is a man who's gotten better looking with every day of his life. No kidding, man. He is a silver fox these days. He looks great. Like, and he always seems to be playing the president of the United States. Even when he's a CEO, like in this movie it's like president ceo wesley snipes is given his bona fides and so forth and bruce greenwood is, is like all right well listen i'm gonna go meet the board of directors here soon i'd like you to come with me mr vice president hey baby what'd you say and he's like that's right if the board of directors agrees to this hire you are going to be the vice president of terror counter terrorism or something like i don't really know what job it is that wesley snipes is being offered tom sizemore leans 
leans over. I told you it's a pretty good job, huh? What am I doing again, baby? And he's like, well, I don't know. I don't know what I do, honestly, Wesley Snipes. Is, it's great. I get paid these enormous <laughs> sums of money, and I have absolutely no idea what my job description is. So Bruce Greenwood invites Wesley Snipes to come to Los Angeles to make everything official. So we cut to Wesley Snipes walking through a pre-9-11 security checkpoint <laughs> at this airport where this female security agent says, I have to check you for myself. And she pulls out her the metal detecting wand and she scans it over him and like gets real close to his dick. And it's like, beep, beep. And then there's more conversation about Wesley Snipes, you know, engaging with other people who are black and it's a black thing and how he and Tom Sizemore are brothers. It's all uncomfortable white guy, black guy banter. This is the, hey, aren't we living in a post-racial society kind of 90s uh -huh. vibe. But to this movie's credit, it does kind of nod at a lot of subtle racism that happens in this movie that I like. Here's one thing that bothers me. After he goes through security, then they both go over to the ticket counter, which is completely back. And this movie <laughs> yeah. is riddled with continuity errors. Oh, sure. Look, we're here to have a good time, not pay attention to the details, Chad. But this is another <laughs> long scene where Tom Sizemore is very much trying to tell this friend of his, hey, I want you to go out there. I want you to be yourself. You're going to be great. I'm really happy that you've got this opportunity and that you're getting back in the game. And Wesley Snipes looks like he just wants to punch this guy in the face the entire walk from security to the ticket counter to the gate. Right. And this is the point where he says, listen, baby, the only reason I'm going to take this job is to make your life hell. And you're like, what? Why on earth would you take a job out of spite for the <laughs> one person that offered the job to you? That seems really backwards. Before Wesley Snipes leaves to get on the plane, Tom Sizemore says, uh, hey, I got a big surprise for you. Call me when you reach Los Angeles. I want to hear all about this. <laughs> yeah, there's no payoff to that either. There is no well, indication. I think it's in reference to Marty, right? That uh, she's on the plane. Because he it? was there when she stabbed Wesley Snipes in the foot with her high heel. So Tom Sizemore is the head of counterterrorism and is so in the weeds with his job he knows what flight attendants are on a flight? Well, they only have one plane, Bo. Oh, fair enough. All right, well, that does make it easier. <laughs> <laughs> we get a bunch of second unit shots of airplanes flying around and landing, and then we see our movie's villain, Charles Rain, who is a suspected airline terrorist and he's being boarded on a commercial airline so everyone takes their seats on the plane and we get some more of that funky bass driven jazz our bad guy steps aboard and we see that marty the flight attendant from the training earlier is here so like oh this will be fun mm -hmm. and then we meet one of our many henchmen his name is forge mm -hmm. it's pronounced forget and he has a blue earring mm -hmm. so we'll recognize him later yeah michael horse is the actor's name who plays Hawk Ka -ka, ka -ka! on the Twin Peaks seasons one, two, and three. And he is terrific on that show. Was he better than he was in this movie? Yes. Yes. He is <laughs> underutilized to say the least. But yeah. So Hawk ka -ka, ka -ka! is on the plane and I could yeah. not be happier. And then we see a young Elizabeth Hurley, yeah. who is also a flight attendant. I saw her name in the opening credits, and I was like, what? Okay, let's see what happens with this. Oh, she's going to be a bad guy, which she, you immediately know she's on Team Terrorist. She's way too eager to please to prove that she's not a bad guy, but she is. Also, she has this conversation with her and Marty in the galley, uh -huh. where Marty is taking the, the head count, and Elizabeth Hurley is like, I can't wait to get to Los Angeles are the men there as good as I've heard oh I've heard they actually can talk without cue cards is that true I love your blouse look at your earrings you're adorable we should be best friends forever and ever and she makes a comment about you know some people say my accent makes me sound cold and heartless like a villain <laughs> and Murray's like no 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 you sound fine wait what was that about a villain again <laughs> nothing nothing there's also a bad guy named Vincent who's a baggage loader he's gonna show up later yeah and so there's a bit on the plane where there's a kid uh, before they take off uh, this kid's aiming finger guns at rain and the fbi agent in the seat behind him uh-huh and rain is like hmm, little children 
so delicious. And he d- does uh, uh, some finger guns back at him, but it shows off his handcuffs. And the kid gets like real, oh, oh my goodness, that guy's a bad guy. Yeah. When Marty's walking around and she's doing the count of the people on the plane, you know, she's like 23, 24, 55, 56, and then she's 57. And passenger 57, Bo, is none other than the guy who she stabbed in the foot with her shoe the day before or last month or six months ago. I have no idea how time plays out in this. And it's Wesley Snipes, and he's reading The Art of War, Mm -hmm. which, no, he isn't. Every hero in the 90s had a copy of Sun Tzu's Art of War somewhere in the movie. It was on a (laughs) shelf. They were reading it in their back pocket, something. Because we all thought that's what made you super smart if you were a hero. Well, he just finished Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. (laughs) Right. He's getting all his Buddhism (laughs) from the best sources. (laughs) After this, he's going to tackle the Tao of Pooh. Oh. You know what? Not a bad book. I prefer <laughs> Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. That's really the best of uh, the lot. But Tao of Pooh is not terrible. So Elizabeth Hurley is wandering the aisles. They are asking for uh, food orders. And the FBI agent after he leaves is like, boy, it, she's a real hotski McTotsky. Hey, looks like I just found my next ex-wife, am I right? <laughs> it's one of those like, that Veronica Vaughn is one hot piece of ace. <laughs> If you know what I mean. (laughs) Like, why is this FBI agent, like, making bro jokes with this suspected terrorist? You keep it professional. What is this, a midnight run? (laughs) The FBI agent does ask Charles Wright, So, uh, is your dad alive? I heard uh, he made your childhood kind of terrible, and that's why you're such a violent criminal. And Charles Wright says, My father died violently on the toilet, surrounded by wolves, reading the Holy Bible as my mother watched on Christmas Eve as I killed him. (laughs) <laughs> oh my goodness oh you sound like one bad dude marty ends up making all the pre-flight uh, announcements and so forth and while she's doing that wesley snipes kind of locks eyes with her and is hitting the call button right away mm-hmm. and elizabeth hurley is like who is that and marty says oh i know that guy just ignore he's an this. asshole right <laughs> this guy's just an enormous jerk we're going to ignore the call button that he is continuously hitting she does say he's airline security or something yeah. and elizabeth is like hmm i'll have to keep an eye on this one well, i just want to point out this movie is padded with so much nothing because throughout all of this we get repeated scenes of stock footage of airplanes on the ground and in the air and taking off and taxiing around but the movie's only like an hour 23 so yeah but it's not even that the end credits are like four minutes yeah those opening credits were two or three i think all in it's maybe 77 right god bless it the amount of stock footage is rough but the movie kind of gets down to business pretty quick from here yeah and then it completely puts on the brakes Ooh, yeah unfortunately yes but <laughs> so like elizabeth hurley goes and, and hands out menus and is taking some orders this kid's mother the one that was doing the finger guns with rain earlier stewardess stewardess that man with the handcuffs over there sitting next to the man with the gun is he a criminal <laughs> See a danger to my precious little Trevor here? Trevor, get your finger out of your nose. Get your heads out of your pants. I said get your fingers out of your nose. And the kid is like, boy, I'm going to shoot that guy with my fake gun if he causes any trouble and he can't hurt me because I have a Dakota ring that stops all viruses and bullets. And spiders. But I left it at home. And you know that Elizabeth Hurley is a villainess in this movie because she doesn't immediately say, why, that's the most boring story I've ever heard. I'm going to leave now. Instead, she's like, well, aren't you the cutest little thing? Well, we'll make sure that you're taken care of. And you're like, oh, nobody is that nice. What a delightful and delusional little child you have here. Listen, Trevor, that was your name, was it? I have a Dakota ring with me, and I'll make sure that you're the first child to die in this movie later. <clears throat> Forget what I just said. How about if you give me a smile i'll bring you a soda pop that would be delicious right what type of arsenic would you like in it flavorless or flavorful boy i like the kind that tastes like almonds oh well we'll make it sure it's the nuttiest cola in all the land trevor lean in does this cloth smell like chloroform so wesley snipes just gets out of his seat at this point to stalk and find marty getting (laughs) her, her cart together hey baby i've had my light on for quite a while now why are you ignoring me baby and she's like because i've got a job to 
to do, and I know you're a grown adult that can handle himself for two goddamn seconds while I attend the other hundreds of passengers on this flight. Look, baby, I know I was hard on you in class, all right? This is going to be a long flight. How can we build up some sexual tension between you and me? Look, I like to be in control, baby, which is why I also don't like flying on planes. See, I'm an aviation security expert, but ironically, I don't like to fly. Isn't that ironic? Or maybe it's just a contradiction in expectations. You know, a lot of Alanis Morissette's examples of irony in her hit song, Ironic, are actually just coincidence, and they're not irony at all. Truly the most ironic thing about that song, Ironic, is the title Ironic, as it is expected that the song would include actual examples of irony when, for the most part, it's merely discussions of unfortunate circumstances, baby. What do you want me to do? And he says, look, all I'm asking, baby, is that I'm a little bit of a nervous player. Just check on me time to time. And like, what? <laughs> check on you? Like, make sure you're still breathing like you're an infant? I don't understand what, what this duty is that I suddenly have to make sure you're all right. This whole exchange undermines this movie as a diehard knockoff. It is a diehard knockoff. Don't get me wrong. But Wesley Snipes is not an everyman who's thrust into unusual circumstances. As I mentioned earlier, he's more like a John Rambo in that he is a man with a background uniquely suited to handle the situation in which he finds himself. Yeah. Until a little bit later when we go to the county fair. Stick around, <laughs> loyal listeners. So there's a bit with <laughs> Elizabeth Hurley and Charles Rain where like she's going to grab orders for food and uh, the FBI agent says, I'll have the chicken. And tomato juice, Bo. Yeah. That's what he orders to drink with the chicken dinner. <laughs> He's making some homemade chicken parmesan. He's like, I got a little mozzarella in my pocket. <laughs> He's got a flask of vodka. And Charles Ray is like, <laughs> How appropriate that you would order the chicken. I will have the steak bloody and keep the champagne on ice. We'll celebrate later. You and me, Elizabeth Hurley. I mean, random stewardess who I just met moments ago. By the way, tell your mother happy birthday. <laughs> I mean, if you have a mother and it's her birthday. And I sent her something special. If I knew her, which I don't. Stranger. Immediately, we know that these two are in cahoots, as uh, police say. This guy is full on doing a Hans Gruber impression in this movie. Yes. As to tie it back to Die Hard. It's eerie how much he is doing Hans Gruber, just with a mullet in place of the beard. They just sort of spun the facial hair around a bit. It's Hans Gruber by way of Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> yes, it is. So while he's <laughs> hamming it up in the middle seat, Marty gets an old woman to sit beside Wesley Snipes. Uh, uh -huh. She's like, well, here's a way I don't have to check on you all the time because this old bitty flies constantly and she'll make sure you're okay. <laughs> and he's like, oh, shit. I shouldn't have asked for any of this. This is a little bit of subtle racism that I like in this movie. This sort of like all you people look alike to me kind of thing. <laughs> where this old woman <laughs> says, you know, I love that show you're on. And he's like, show baby and she says yeah you know when you do the woo 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 and the things that make you go hmm which listeners below the age of i don't know 35 will not right. understand this reference but yeah. arsenio hall had a talk show in which he did that bed and the audience would do the whoop 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 and yeah. but i again i like the fact that wesley snipes gets this healthy dose of casual racism from this woman and has just had it is just like you know what i'm gonna go to the bathroom baby is it racist that she can't tell him yes. apart from arsenio hall yes. because i can't tell jessica chastain and bryce dallas howard apart unless one of them's being chased by a dinosaur that's just a coin toss for me that's very different because those are uh doppelgangers whereas <laughs> wesley snipes and arsenio hall look nothing alike other than the fact that they are both black people <laughs> so yes is it racist you're right a hundred percent does the movie know that it's racist i think so oh it absolutely knows that it's racist wait till we get to the air traffic control tower oh my goodness yes wesley snipes has zero tolerance for backwoods racists and i am here for all of it so <laughs> anyway elizabeth hurley calls down to vincent henchman luggage handler who's in this lower level of the plane i didn't know that was a thing i, didn't I guess because i fly cheap airlines 
<laughs> yeah, I'm basically on a school bus with wings when I fly. Not only is there not a belly to the plane like this, I don't think there are wheels. And she, she says, will you send up that mysterious package? And he's like, yep on its way so he sends a thing up on a dumbwaiter and for a second you're like are they gonna do an under siege 2 dumbwaiter gag and they do not which is unfortunate they kind of do they escape out of it like they did in under siege 2 i suppose you're right never mind i retract my uh <laughs> former statement senator wesley snipes gets up to escape that passive aggressive racism that this old white woman is throw it his way and he goes in the back to take a shit and charles rain he looks over at the fbi agent that's sitting beside him and he says do you know the time because that's his thing bo mm -hmm. he asks people if they know what time it is before shit pops off yeah and then elizabeth early walks past with this rolling cart and she asks charles rain how do you like your sirloin and he says bloody and then elizabeth early removes the plate cover revealing a gun with a silencer he grabs the gun she's got a gun they start shooting people they kill off the fbi agent pew, pew, and chaos ensues hawk stands up Ca -ca! Ca -ca! he's taking some shots at people uh -huh. it's great and rain busts into the cockpit of this plane and this is maybe my favorite moment in this movie where uh -huh. he kicks open the door again this is uh -huh. all pre 9-11 kind of oh, absolutely there wasn't even a lock on it hell i thought it was just gonna be a bunch of dangling beads they have saloon doors <laughs> uh, for the cockpit or did and he says who's in charge here and the pilot says i am and rain just shoots this dude right in the head uh -huh. and then he says again who is in charge here and then the cola pilot says well he was and then charles rain shoots the pilot again yeah and he says who is in charge and the co-pilot says he was in charge and so he shoots him a third time and he's like look you idiots when i ask you who's in charge you say me i'm in charge now once again who's in charge uh me i'm in charge no morons i charles rain i'm in charge i've got the gun you two suck you don't know how to do this bit fuck you i hate working with bad improvisers amateurs it's yes and yes and someone give me a scene an airplane give me a situation terrorists are taking over very good now we're going to act this out one more time who is in charge um he was no <laughs> damn it all right land this plane preferably in chicago let's get some second city members on here there is chaos on the plane ensuing and rain gets on the pa and is telling the passengers you know i have taken over this plane if you cooperate you will be fine if you try to be a hero you will be shot henchman hog is left in the cockpit to keep an eye on all of the pilots and make sure that they don't try anything funny uh-huh wesley snipes he's still in the bathroom taking a dump and avoiding microaggressions of this racist old woman and he hears all this going down and he's like oh shit terrorists have taken over the plane and he peeks out of the toilet and then bo we suddenly meet a new henchman that we've never seen before who has a glorious curly mullet and wesley snipes he closes the bathroom door Door, then he opens it up and he sticks his credit card in this phone so that he can make up like a public phone call and there's a wireless phone receiver so he pulls it in the toilet to call for help and all of this is not suspenseful in any way no no and if the plane were haunted that is the only way you could explain this bathroom door suddenly being opened then closed and <laughs> open again so wesley snipes is calling tom sizemore uh-huh and tom sizemore is in a meeting where he's basically like all right Right, everybody are we here to do business business everybody doing business great business is happening and his <laughs> secretary comes in and gives him a message he's like wait a second i'm sorry to interrupt business everybody but i've got to take this call and he gets to the phone in time to hear wesley snipes as hattie mcdaniel screaming yeah oh lord don't hurt me the terrorists have taken over the plane he gets as far as don't hurt me and the guy raises his gun and then wesley snipes is flips on his action hero switch yeah and just karate chops the gun out of this dude's hand grabs it puts this guy in a chokehold and tom sizemore by the way is overhearing all of this and is like 
Oh, this don't sound so good. Forget all the business I was conducting. I need an emergency non-business meeting now. When Wesley Snipes beating up the henchman with the glorious mullet, he slams his head in the bathroom door. Henchman mullet, he dunks his head in the toilet water, mm -hmm. giving him both pink eye and blue eye at the same time. I like the blue water <laughs> streaming down this guy's face as he cracks his skull against the galley wall afterwards. It's pretty good. There's a bunch of punching and fighting, and ultimately, Wesley Snipes grabs the guy, puts the gun gun next to his wretched smelling toilet water head because wesley snipes didn't have time to flush no 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 i don't know if it's pee water or doo-doo water well that's why they call it poo pee because it's poo and pee Ew. hey you learn something new every day I, I think that's in the oed wesley snipes appears with this guy in his grasp from the cockpit area well not to be outdone charles rain takes marty hostage this is so stupid it's like the start of the movie Bo. that's how the movie started remember so rain is it decides to give up Marty as a hostage at a certain point. Well, at first, Wesley Snipes says, hey, baby, drop the fucking gun or your friend dies. And Charles Rain says, I have no friends. And then Elizabeth Hurley, she shows up and she has a gun pointed at Wesley Snipes. Right. But she doesn't have a hostage. So that's where Charles Rain throws his hostage, Marty, over to Elizabeth Hurley. And then he takes a new hostage. So everybody's got a hostage and everybody's got a gun. So Rain says, what is your name, hostage of mine? Uh, uh, Douglas. Douglas Brain Splatter, sir. Hmm, interesting. Tell me, Douglas, are you a married man? Yeah, I've got a daughter, too. That's very good. So, would you like to see Douglas's brain splatter, just like his last name? Wait, what? Oh, I don't like the sound of that. And Wesley Snipes, much like in the flashback, gives up his gun. He's like, all right, baby, it's cool. I'm not going to try to get in the way. And then Rain is like, hmm, no. You won't. And then just shoots this dude, shoots the, the guy that Wesley Snipes had, the long-haired thug, and after shooting Douglas in the head. So he, he has killed Douglas Brain Splatter uh -huh. and the henchman who he said, I, I hate disappointment or whatever. That guy is now dead, but it does allow time for Wesley Snipes and Marty to escape to this galley elevator that they then take down. We do get a little black and white flashback here to remind us that this is all like Lisa's tragic death in that convenience store earlier. Remember 10 minutes ago in the movie, one of the more quick knee jerk flashbacks that you're going to see in some. Cinema. I'm like, hey, remember that scene you just saw? You show me black and white footage of a convenience store. I'm thinking about clerks. <laughs> <laughs> right. I wasn't even supposed to be here today. And now I've been shot. How is he making a clerks three? Uh, look, somebody's going. <laughs> like somewhere clerks two looks to have made money, right? Uh, that's the only way that <laughs> it happens. had to have. Yeah. I saw Clerks 2 and I there had some funny moments. Kevin yeah. Smith was probably the most 90s movie director of the 90s. Oh, for sure. Like Mallrats is by no means do I think that is the best Kevin Smith movie, but Mallrats like made a cultural impact. Yeah, Chasing Amy was in there, and Dogma. I'm a Jersey Girl apologist. I think that movie's all right. Yeah, he directed Zack and Miri Make a Porno. I don't know if he wrote that one or not. I think he did. Yeah. Guy is still out there doing it. Whether or not you like his output, it's hard to deny the fact that he's managed to cobble together a pretty impressive career. Yeah, good for Kevin Smith. Yeah, that's really the point of this podcast. We'll all see right, you next so week, everybody. so what's up on, oh. next, uh, on the final episode of Pick 6 movie? Yeah. Oh, wait, we gotta finish <laughs> talking about All right, so, so they go down to the gal where they find Vincent, the galley henchman, uh -huh. and who's playing all those things. Like, oh, I'm just the guy who sends up all the food. What's going on up there? Things sound crazy. As Wesley Snipes is, I guess, looking for a weapon or something. He says, you know, I think we ought to just do what Mr. Rain wants. And Wesley Snipes <laughs> is like, wait a second. How did he know his name, baby? And then he turns around and Vincent is there about to fight and then they scrap as well vincent has a knife yeah in his boot or something he pulls it out and watching these two fight it's i reference this a lot because the most uneven fight in cinematic history was when tom cruise fought wilford brimley <laughs> in the firm i can't think of one that was more uneven yeah but this comes pretty close because this guy vincent he's a short his hair's receding he, he clearly does not look like a guy who's going to be able to take a punch let alone throw one and the fact is wesley snipes delivers his trademark line of gotta go gotta go which he never says again and i'm not sure what it means here but mm -hmm. he kicks this guy in the chest so hard it punches him through 
through a door in the belly of the plane. I don't know if that means the kick was really hard or the door was really cheap. Either way, Vincent's down for the count. Yeah, he's out. <laughs> so there's a quick cutaway to Tom Sizemore and his emergency meeting as he's like, boy, I got to tell you guys, things sure seem screwy up there on that plane. And he just starts barking orders around this table like, you, I need the reports from Baltimore. You, I need a passenger manifest. You, turn on that machine that goes bing. It's like Lloyd Bridges in Airplane. Of <laughs> just this cutaway of him barking orders at people that you've never met. You don't know exactly what he's asking for, but it's kind of great. We cut back to the plane and Henchman Hawk, he's dragging the corpse of Douglas Brain Splatters down the aisle of the walkway between seats, leaving a trail of blood and possibly poo and pee because I hear that you shit yourself when you die. I have no firsthand evidence of that, but it's a rumor I choose to believe. Wesley Snipes says, all right, what I'm going to do here, baby, is I'm going to pull this lever dump all the fuel and force this plane down and marty says like you can't do that like you're gonna end up getting us all killed and he goes damn it lisa i don't have time to argue with you about this and she's like wait a second my name's not lisa is my name lisa have i been living a lie this whole time i could be a lisa I think I look like a Lisa. You know what? I'm going to be go by Lisa now. And she says, listen, Fred, I mean, if we're going to be naming people, just giving random names to each other, uh, she says, listen, if you're going to pull that handle and dump all the fuel on this plane, you need to tell me that you're good at this. And he says, baby, I'm the best at this. Talking about people giving other people names, when I was in college, I knew a guy who went on to become an architect and his name was Mark Kung. And hello, Mark, if you're listening, which you're not. Um, Mark's parents were immigrants from Korea, I believe. And he told me that on his first day in school in America, he had an older sister and a younger brother and they were playing <laughs> in their backyard and their, these neighbor kids were over. And he said, I forget what his given name at birth was, but he wanted wanted to have an American name. So he asked this neighbor kid to give him an American name and he just sized him up and he said, you look like a Mark. He went, okay. He was like, will you give my sister a name? He was like, mm, Jennifer. How about my brother? Mm, Thomas. Okay. Those are our names. It was the closest thing to Ellis Island I've ever come in my life that for the rest of the, he's like, so now I'm Mark, she's Jennifer and he's Thomas. That's crazy. <laughs> Imagine wielding that kind of power. At age eight. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Given the way that kids name pets, it's amazing that his name isn't like Hot Dog or... You're Corvette <laughs> and you're Incredible Hulk. You're Battletoads. You're Legend of Zelda. And you're Optimus Prime. Yeah. Done. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so ever since then, my name has been Rubik's Cube Kung. <laughs> This is my sister, Potato Chips. That's wonderful. We are also introduced to another henchman that we've never seen before, who looks like a grown version of Harry Potter if he'd never found his way to Hogwarts. <laughs> He's this like 20-something with wire rim glasses. At first, I was confused because I'm like, who's this guy with a gun reading a comic book? I was like, is he just a passenger who picked up a firearm that just got left on the floor? But he'll show up a little later, but not for long. A real unnecessary character. Speaking of unnecessary, we get an unnecessary scene where Tom Sizemore is getting briefed on Charles Rain, and you're like, we know all this already, because it's just some guy being like, well, it turns out that he killed his father when he was a child. We know that. Right. And he's a suspected terrorist. Yeah. Yeah, we know. I got it. I think he's involved in some bombings. Yeah, like, like from the scene with the attorney earlier? Got it. Okay. <laughs> Did you know that his nickname is the Reign of Terror? R-A-Y-N-E? It's a little fun wordplay. We have fun here. That leads to Bruce Greenwood showing back up, President CEO uh -huh. and he says uh, what is going on why didn't you tell me that you were going to have a terrorist on this plane and Tom Sizemore is like look boss we didn't even know they just show up and just throw <laughs> dangerous criminals on public transportation they don't need a reason it's what he says yeah they find open seats and they fill them up with child molesters and arsonists in a very cheeky moment Bruce Greenwood says well they should have put this guy on a bus or a train or something it's like all right at least you're citing the source material I suppose. Then Tom Sizemore says, listen, I got to tell you something, boss. Wesley Snipes is up there on that plane, too. Remember we told him to fly to Los Angeles to seal the deal? I don't know why we're here in Orlando or Jacksonville or Miami, wherever this movie started out, but All right. he's on his way to L.A. We find out that the, the plane it starts drifting around and 
Rain is like, what in the hell is going on up there? And so he storms in the cockpit and says, someone, not the dead one, someone else tell me what's going on up here. <laughs> and the co-pilot is like, you're in charge. Nailed it. Damn it. That's not the question. What is going on up here? Then you say, what is going on up here? Okay. What is going on up here? No, no, you are going to tell me what is actually happening. What is actually happening? I'm confused by all this, sir. I'm just the co-pilot. Only had one semester of improv. <laughs> and he finally tells him, like, oh, well, it turns out the fuel has all been dumped and we've got to land somewhere pretty fast. And then Rain says, well, then by all means, land the plane. We cut down to this local airport and there is this air traffic controller and he says, Tango, Tango, this is Lake Lucille Regional Hee Haw Airport. Look, we can't handle a jumbo jet down here. I suggest you reroute, Tango, Tango. And Charles Ring, he's in the cockpit and he shouts back, suggestion refused. <laughs> They're going to have to land the plane at this podunk airport. The old man running the tower, who probably owns the airport, I would think, tells his <laughs> wife, I assume it's his wife, because she's an old lady who's also working in this tower. And he's like, well, you better call Atlantic International Airlines. Tell them that one of their planes is coming down here. Also, call the hospital. And a hearse. Mm -hmm. So at Atlantic International HQ, uh -huh. they find out like, oh, this plane's going to have to go down in Lake Wasil, Louisiana, this podunk airport out in the middle of nowhere. And so Bruce Greenwood says, all right, Tom Sizemore, you're going to get down there via helicopter to head off the press. And uh -huh. Tom Sizemore, in, an, in a character trait that doesn't matter anywhere in this movie, appears to be afraid to fly in a helicopter. Is it just me or is one of the prerequisites to work for this airline is that you don't like to fly apparently so look <laughs> let me ask you a couple of questions before we hire you here at atlantic international have you ever flown before no no how soon can you start tomorrow you're hired have you ever shit yourself on a plane you have well that's good have you ever <laughs> been in a helicopter on say a tour of a city like las vegas no oh of course not <laughs> Oh, good. Why would I do that? Uh, no, I'm deathly afraid of anything that leaves the ground more than, say, 15 feet. Even <laughs> trampolines are a push for me. Birds scare me? You are executive material, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we do get a scene where Wesley Snipes and Marty, the flight attendant, they're down in this belly of the plane luggage area, and they're waiting for the plane to land or crash. And Marty says, so who's Lisa? I mean, I know I'm Lisa now, but you called me Lisa earlier before I decided to adopt that name. Why did you call me Lisa when we were screaming? at each other and wesley snipe says hey baby she was my wife she was with me when i tried to stop a robbery well technically i did stop the robbery but she got shot in the head baby not by me by the robber i did shoot and kill the robber who technically was a murderer not a robber because he didn't steal anything it's real complicated baby before she can ask anything in cross the phone rings uh -huh. which wesley snipe answers hey baby your plan's not working out as you hope isn't it well i have to tell you you make a good adversary but you will never defeat me i am far too clever dumping the fuel was very smart, Wesley Snipes. Now the body of Douglas Brain Splatters won't have to travel so far to return to his weeping daughter. Why is my daddy dead, she will say. Who is the man responsible for this, she will say. And Wesley Snipes will be the name that Francine Brain Splatters will curse until the day she dies or kills you in revenge, Wesley Snipes. So Wesley Snipes' counter here, it's, it's the trailer moment where he says, let me ask you something baby you ever play roulette and he says well sometimes it's an interesting question i prefer all, lots of games of chance really i play little blackjack little roulette i go with 200 dollars in my pocket and i say this is all i'm going to spend and he <laughs> says well when you're playing roulette here's a little piece of advice okay always bet on black and then he hangs up leaving ray to be like oh, well that only seems like it would work half the time not even that you've got to take into account there was a couple of green spaces on there if i remember correctly i don't think that his math adds up quite right hello hello wesley snipes say that oh he hung up oh son of a bitch so <laughs> while they're in this hole wesley snipes finds an awesome leather jacket that he's gonna use for the rest of the movie yeah he just pilfers through people's luggage so they can find something that makes him look cool and it does there's no getting around that and <laughs> vincent who is tied up starts shuffling around again and so wesley snipes just knocks him back out for good measure yeah it's one of those movie punches in the head that across the brow and you're immediately unconscious or dead right although he's unconscious and <laughs> yeah uh what he hasn't noticed however is that henchman hawk 
is also down in the galley hiding out. The plane is coming in over this town, Chad, right over a county fair, where we see the police chief look up as this plane flies overhead. Uh huh. And he's like, Boy, that do seem like it is coming in real low. We better get over there to the tower and see what's going on. And Chief Biggs is this guy's name. We'll get more out uh-huh. of him in a minute. But he's eating like a, a chocolate ice cream cone. <laughs> yep. And he just shoves it into the hand of one of the deputies. Who there? You go you getting going and finding something useful for you to be doing around here. And this deputy just starts eating the <laughs> The ice cream cone that Chief Biggs has given him like he is fresh out of the school for the challenged. It is hilarious. And no. it also reminded me of a pre-COVID world where you could just eat after somebody without winding up on a ventilator. This plane lands at the airport. So much for the airport not being able to handle a plane this large. Wesley Snipes, he opens up the door and he and Marty are going to jump out of the plane as it's slowly taxiing around to somewhere. And then Henchman Hawk, who's been hanging out he shows up and kicks wesley snipes out of the plane and wesley snipes almost gets run over by the large wheels on the landing gear but henchman hawk grabs marty in his arms snatches her back inside and closes the door ha ha tom sizemore helicoptering in gets a call from president and ceo bruce greenwood <laughs> and bruce greenwood says look i've had a great idea if this works out you're gonna tell the press that we had wesley snipes on that plane on purpose as part of this counterterrorism initiative and if it doesn't work out aka a bunch of passengers get killed don't say a goddamn word about wesley snipes and he's like <laughs> uh okay i guess back on the plane our villain pimp slaps marty with the back of his hand for her insolence and he said i had such wonderful plans for us if she disobeys kill her all right so back to chief big shad Uh uh-huh as he and his deputy show up on the tarmac and pull guns on wesley snipes and cuff him. well here it's it's just the deputy right right right, they pull the guns on wesley snipes and he says hey baby i'm airport security and this sheriff's deputy says yeah and i'm the Governor of Louisiana, get on the ground, asshole. And I, for one, was very surprised at the restraint he had in not using any racial slurs here. There's a lot of dancing around that. You get one boy a little bit later. There's a quite a few boys that come up, and it's like, what are you? Oh, God. Yeah, it's rough. So we get a look inside the tower as Chief Biggs is on the horn with Rain. Oh, my. Doing hostage negotiation. Right. This is way way above his pay grade and well outside his training and work experience well outside his field of expertise which is mostly moonshine and racism he says this here police chief lino Biggs, you tell me what you want and i be tell you what i can do all right listen you here billy you'll <laughs> notice if you look at the plane that we're shoving dead bodies onto the tarmac i'm going to execute three people every five minutes until i speak with someone who can negotiate for my demands which seems like just doing the back of the envelope math on this chad three every five minutes you're gonna run out of passengers pretty fast it's like that old game of like hey if i give you one penny today or two pennies tomorrow and double it each day or i just give you twenty thousand dollars right now which are you gonna make more from right i don't think he's taking into account how quickly those passengers are gonna run out they do toss out the dead pilot and charles rain says i executed the pilot and five other passengers he doesn't know that we haven't done that yet i'm bluffing get me a fuel truck or i shall murder again and they they chunk out the pilot and if you ever watch this movie please don't there's this wonderful shot of the pilot being chunked out but the plane is painted red on top and it's silver on the bottom mm-hmm. and you can see the stuntman fall into the blue landing pad <laughs> in the reflection of the, the plane that's fantastic <laughs> sheriff big says look right here i want to help all right how do i know you won't kill all the old passengers once i give you the fuel and rain says Look, I'm going to start murdering these passengers. You better get a fuel truck out here pretty gosh darn fast, mister. Oh, I can't argue with that. Get this man some fuel. And Rain hangs up and says, check and mate. Not only is Rain proud of this, Chief Biggs also very proud as he <laughs> sips some coffee. Is like, yeah, you let the FBI see if they do any better than that. That was pretty good. 
He said he going to release 100 passengers. Eh? You know what? FBI can't do that. Look at you, Charles B. Uh-huh. And then, for no good reason, we cut back to President CEO Bruce Greenwood getting yet another update on Charles Rain, where th they're like, oh, he's releasing some of the passengers. And he goes, oh, my God. God, why that's to create a distraction. Not only am I the CEO of this airline, I'm an expert in <laughs> counterterrorism. And I know for a fact that this guy has a habit of killing a lot of people just so he can escape. He's going to blow up my plane and that's going to be a distraction. That's how he's going to get away. Which, spoilers, none of that happened. Does not happen even a little bit. I got excited. I was like, oh, that's what he's going to do. He's going to blow up this plane. We're going to end with a big kaboom. No. Yeah. This movie really ends with a, like a real fire. <laughs> It, yes it's not great but yeah so sure enough they they take fuel to the plane deputy daryl and his other brother deputy daryl they drag wesley snipes up into the air traffic control tower and we see there is again an exercising of restraint when it comes to using racial slurs that truly deserves a pat on the back because one of them says we got him down on the runway he attacked us which i think any time a deputy makes an arrest in this county and it involves a person person of color that on the police report <laughs> it is checked by default that that individual attacked the police officer it's like pre-printed on the form that they use when filling out <laughs> like some sort of paper trail when arresting a person of color you have to erase it, it the form just comes that way <laughs> <laughs> there are two boxes like caucasian suspect everyone else but yeah so the chief biggs is kind of interrogating him at, and wesley snipes is like hey baby why is that fuel truck out there he's never going to release those hostages that's that's not in his best interest which spoilers again he totally does at least some of them and then charles ray calls is like chief biggs i meant to ask you did one of you happen to find a black gentleman who is very handsome and knows kung fu why that is one of my men he is escaped and i'm very upset with him so if you were to happen to i don't know shoot him that is kind of okay <laughs> with me i'll see that as a gesture of good faith actually in fact i'm going to release another 700 hostages he doesn't even know how many people are on the plane look it's louisiana they can't count i could tell him it's a million he would believe anything chief biggs immediately pulls a gun on wesley snipe again i'm dumbfounded how all of these rural louisiana law enforcement officers are holding him at gunpoint without shooting him and chief big <laughs> says that's smooth talking you born the radio stage you be one he's me now and wesley's time says hey baby i know motherfuckers who say they saw elvis in the goddamn mall which made me think about a time that you and i watched an hour-long expose on the possibility that elvis presley faked his own death and was still alive uh-huh in the 90s hosted by bill bixby uh -huh. and it was called the elvis files do you remember that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. follow-up question do you remember when you and i watched a full hour documentary on the australian daredevil jim the bullet bailey oh who got God. dragged through burning bales of hay and then he ultimately died when he was strapped to the underbelly of this small plane to perform a similar stunt but his rigging gave way and he just plummeted to earth to his death oh yes that was glorious remember that one yes dude i remember you and i being shocked watching this man die in front of us on what was like a and e or back when the learning channel wasn't riddled with obese people and basically a carnival sideshow <laughs> right when it wasn't just like we're hunting for ghosts here on the <laughs> right. learning channel asterisk no learning required i'm gonna go find video footage of both of those things and i'm gonna post it somewhere for others to see especially that stuntman documentary was tremendous but yeah so the <laughs> chief biggs is pulling this gun on him let me see some RD, Wesley Snipes. Look, I, I know it may seem strange I got this gun pulled on you, Rachel, but what would you do if you were in my position? And Wesley Snipes says, I'd kill myself, baby. <laughs> As Burns go, not bad. He does look at the ID and he says, oh, he said, this do be show you is Wesley Snipes, but I don't see no facts that you be here on security for DC plane company. All right. We cut back over to the plane where we are reminded that Elizabeth Hurley is in this movie. Mm -hmm. And Charles Rand comes over and says, wait an hour before resuming the plan. If they don't give us clearance to take off, start killing passengers until they do. Oh, it's pretty good. And so the plane doors open and Rain and 
and a, a couple of his other thugs take the elevator mm -hmm. down into the galley. Not Harry Potter and Vincent, the balding luggage guy. They just pop out of the bottom of the plane and just wander off unnoticed. Using the other passengers release. By the way, one guy got, gets real pushy trying to get out of the plane and Henchman Hawk just murders him and yeah. uh which is pretty good rain and his henchmen are off to other climbs right next door is the county fair happening and they're like mm, boys that looks fun who's hungry for kettle corn hmm? i'm buying i am not leaving this fair until i win that big pink stuffed rabbit now <laughs> i don't know who's good at the ring toss I am mediocre at best, but that is what we are going to have to do today. I know you claim you're very good at shooting, what is it you say here in America, hoops? But it's impossible. The game's impossible. The size of the ball is bigger than the hoop it goes through. That's the trick. The, and also, the milk bottles, they're full of sand or cement. You can't knock them over. The ones I use for demonstration purposes, are like paper. I looked this up on the internet. I would love to see a circus geek today. I just am in the mood. While they're sneaking off, Wesley Snipes is being removed from the tower and the chief says, uh -huh. I'll tell you what, if he causes any of that damn trouble, you can shoot him, but just in the leg in case he's telling the truth, you know. I'm sure that that's reassuring to Wesley Snipes, a black man taken into custody in rural Louisiana. After he's led away, Chief Biggs asks the old woman who's still milling around this tower, uh -huh. because apparently there's no security or anything. He says, hey, can I get one of them damn, uh, special cups of coffee and maybe some buffering? <laughs> Which really made me laugh. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been funny if he had said Newprin? New Buffering would have been good. Buffering is pretty up there in terms of the fun. Excedrin? Funny. Yeah, buffering's funnier than Excedrin. Are those products even available on market? You cannot get buffering. I think it, it caused some flipper babies, and you just can't buy it anymore. <laughs> so Deputy Daryl and Daryl, they take Wesley Snipes down to the jail, and on their way, this is the first time we hear him called boy yeah. by these two rednecks and then wesley snipes rightfully so just beats the shit out of these two cops and then he leaves the tower and on his way out just roundhouse kicks another officer who didn't do anything wrong other than show up at work that day and wesley snipes steals a police motorcycle room takes off and then two police cruisers give chase after him all of that is true the most impressive thing he does in this scene though is when he does a standing jump over a waist high chain link fence to get to the tarmac so he can steal this motorcycle i was genuinely impressed by it daryl and daryl go back to the tower and they tell the chief uh you know that feller the boy he got away and i'm like again with the boy yeah. stop saying that and one of the deputies says i think he's headed for the fairgrounds he had a look in his eye that said he wanted some cattle corn you two chase after him you probably need more practice having him whoop your ass all right all right go after him and shoot him only if he give you no other option which means you shoot him okay he does say get and your ass whooped in this scene which is pretty good <laughs> and so yeah they go off to find wesley snipes with instructions again not to shoot him uh -huh. unless he leaves no other choice he's definitely getting shot yes we cut to the lake lucille county fair which doesn't louisiana have parishes instead of counties i think that's right in fairness not 100% on the inner workings of Louisiana politics. This movie feels like one of those children's pictures where they intentionally leave in mistakes as a game for you to try to find them all. Like he's wearing a duck for a hat. Very good. Rain and his flunkies are trying to steal a car from the parking lot. Not Harry Potter's like sticking a coat hanger in the window. Yeah, it's real half-ass. No, no, you slide it down, over, then up. Not up and down, up and down. You're not trying to jerk it off oh son of a it was unlocked the whole time you're terrible at this you didn't even ah, cross they see wesley snipe showing up and rain says all right listen vincent you secure transportation and meet me on the other side of the fairgrounds. Me and not Harry Potter are going to take care of this Wesley Snipes once and for all. And I've got a hankering for some cotton candy. Then we also see that some police are showing up in the background. Coming after Wesley Snipes, who's also arrived. We get a cutaway to Chief Biggs, who is just constantly beset upon in this movie because the FBI comes in. Uh -huh. And the FBI agent is like, all right, give me the scoop. What's the situation here? And he says, well, I'll tell you one thing. Two things are all gone or happening right here neither my blood pressure or that plane ain't getting any higher than they are right now you i don't need this folksy charm from chief biggs in the middle of a terrorist situation yeah. biggs does go on to say and also i got my two best men they also my two worst men chasing after wesley snipes who done ding gone over there to the county 
Farrell probably going to give himself some fried Oreo, some fried Snickle ball. And the head of the FBI says, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that Wesley Snipes is out there? He's trained for this. If your men hurt him, I'm going to press charges myself against you, Sheriff Southern Stereotype. And this is also one of those moments that this feels more like a John Rambo yeah. than a John McClane. Yeah, I can see that. I did like that when Wesley Snipes is wandering through the carnival, he goes over and steals yes. a box of popcorn to make him look less conspicuous as he walks around a lot of product placement for Budweiser, Pepsi, and Tabasco brand hot sauce. You know what makes you inconspicuous is somebody chasing after you saying, hey, you need to pay for that. So one of the thugs, though, spots him and the not Harry Potter guy, and he's kind of surreptitiously following him from behind while Wesley Snipes sees rain. They make their way into the livestock tent. Yeah. And there are these children doing square dancing. This is all incredibly boring. And just when you think that our action movie has turned into a real drag, henchman not Harry Potter, who apparently has his own childhood trauma, just pulls out a gun and shoots a clown. Right. I don't think he was trying to shoot Wesley Snipes. I just think he wanted to kill this clown. <laughs> Which alerts Wesley Snipes as soon as clowns start dropping, he knows something's going on. Dude, everybody freaks out, Bo, and one local attendee at this fairground pulls out his own gun to take care of business because, as we all know, Bo, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. But then Charles Rain punches that dude in the face and takes his gun. So now I got two bad guys with two guns. So we need to have two good guys with guns. And I was told there would be no math in this movie. <laughs> Wesley Snipes, <laughs> after somersaulting out of this tent. Uh-huh. He just runs, Bo. He runs away. That's what happened. I guess goes for higher ground by grabbing the car of this Ferris wheel as the Ferris wheel is spinning, dragging him up into the air. And the carny running this just hits the stop button on the Ferris wheel as soon as he gets to the top of the arc of it. Uh huh. At which point, Rain and Not Harry Potter have run to the Ferris wheel as well. And Rain tells Not Harry Potter, go up there and get him. So this guy starts climbing up this ferris wheel looking for wesley snipes but when he gets to the car that he thinks wesley snipes is in it's empty and he looks down at rain on the ground like i don't know boss <laughs> i guess he's invisible now or something hey baby look up here karate kick dude that is how he gets him he just goes hey and the guy looks up and he kicks him in the face look up here look up here good thunk. oh it's pretty good <laughs> and so the wesley uh, snipes slides down the ferris wheel like it's the bat pole wesley snipes hits the ground and charles rain chases after him because wesley snipes has got nothing but his lethal weapon hands and feet charles rain's got that redneck's gun from the livestock tent and then wesley snipes runs and hides in the most unimaginable place you would think at a carnival the merry-go-round and charles rain he also jumps on the merry-go-round these two are like walking in a circle as it spins round and round firing off bullets why didn't charles rain just stand on the side wait for him to come around and shoot him which that's ultimately what happens because charles rain falls off because this carousel is going 30 miles an hour chad this is the fastest movie carousel in the history of carousels yeah he gets thrown free of it because of centrifugal force it grants wishes from the devil <laughs> right yeah one year there's jonathan price in a top hat nearby <laughs> so he gets thrown clear stands up and is gonna shoot wesley snipes when he comes around but wesley snipes gets to the edge and clings to dear life onto this fast moving carousel and then using the force with which he is being propelled by said merry-go-round launches into the air and tackles rain yeah Movie's over, Bo. Cops show up. He's under arrest for the second time in our film. Wesley Snipes is like, yeah, we can go ahead and in this movie, baby, there's another henchman who's looking for a car somewhere. He's wearing khakis and this blue shirt. You find that guy, this movie's done. Roll the credits. Movie is over. If only. Tom Sizemore finally shows up in the movie. Uh, Chief Biggs and the F FBI agent are there. It does have end of movie energy where Wesley Snipes is like, Tom Sizemore, I can't believe you didn't tell me about rain being on this plane baby the villain passes by and the fbi agent says you know i gotta tell you charles rain those agents that you killed on the plane they were my friends and charles rain says <laughs> wonderful i always like knowing the people whose lives i've touched also my people are gonna start killing passengers in 20 minutes if they don't hear from me 
or something. It turns out we've got this whole fourth act of the movie where they go back to the tower where they're holding rain temporarily, I suppose. And Wesley Snipes tells Chief Biggs and Sizemore and the FBI guys like, hey, you need to let me handle this because we've got to get rain back on that plane so that they don't kill a bunch of passengers. Mm -hmm. And the FBI agent is like, hey, we've got a bunch of like, we've got sharpshooters and and people lined up ready to take rain and these gunmen on the plane out right but wesley snipe says well look i'm the only person that can tell you for sure who's who because i was on the plane i'll keep an eye out and i'll I'll tell you who the shooter is and as soon as i give you the word you spring into action and it's a real hazy plan as far as i'm concerned right and tom sizemore agrees because he's like i don't know boss this seems pretty crazy and wesley snipes is like you know what everybody stay right here baby i'm gonna go tell rain myself what is up yeah we also see that vincent the hitchman he commandeers an ambulance and just drives off and like oh that's gonna mean something but it doesn't yeah yeah he just kind of shows up later but yeah so wesley snipes goes to meet with rain alone hello mr snipes you have been a worthy adversary it is a shame we won't be seeing much of each other after today there's a whole lot of bad copying that wesley snipes does where he's kind of roughing him up and whatnot hey baby if anybody on that plane gets hurt it will take more than a jail cell to keep me from ripping your nuts off that's dialogue from this movie so rain says all right i'll give you a deal you get me on that plane and i will release the passengers but only if you can get me back on that plane he also says you and i are not very different we are animals that want to kill he says that's the american way isn't it brother you're used to being taken advantage of aren't you we share the same hunger i know your breed and i'm like Whoa, 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 passenger 57. Yeah. What are you doing here? I guess the argument is you're putting those words in the mouth of the villain, and that makes it kind of okay, but uh, they're going to get him back on the plane. It's all a big setup. But back on the plane, the old racist woman that was sitting beside Wesley Snipes just stands up for no reason. Is like, I want to know what's going on here. When am I going to be able to get off this plane? And Marty is like, you need to sit the fuck down before you get shot, old lady. Before Hawk can shoot her down yeah marty kind of gets her back in her seat but i really like the fact that this woman came very close to getting murdered and in a just world she would have been charles reigns in the tower and he's talking to the airplane and he's on the intercom and he says flight 193 this is daddy if i'm not back on board in five minutes kill all the hostages and he's surrounded by the fbi agents and wesley snipes and they're like ah shit he means business so the feds escort him back onto the plane there are snipers two of them on a rooftop nearby waiting to kill terrorists below the stairs that lead up to the plane there are a couple of cops with tear gas guns and the door of the plane opens up and wesley snipes is watching all this as they escort our villain up the stairs and wesley snipes gives the go-ahead for the snipers to shoot Charles Rain and Henchman Hawk, who's the one opening the door. But the sniper aims and shoots one of the escorting cops and then shoots the second escorting officer. And then we cut to the two snipers who were laying side by side. And it turns out that one of the snipers is now Henchman Vincent. Mm -hmm. How did he get to be one of the snipers? I guess he just saw what was up and ends up like climbing the ladder and killing he's a go-getter that's the kind of guy you want to hire as a henchman nobody asked him to do that he took the initiative you're not wrong about that and then gunfire just erupts all over the place yes all the cops outside firing bullets the two guys below with the tear gas they fire those off the stair truck backs up from the plane drives about a hundred feet tipples over and then just explodes into a fireball oh it's so good those things are dangerous bo yeah apparently just a tinderbox waiting to happen made of (laughs) nothing but balsa wood and kerosene wesley snipes does a movie shoulder roll and then he shoots vincent who is making his way down a staircase off the roof of this building and i don't know the actor who played henchman vincent but he does this full body tumble down this extended flight of stairs that would make chevy chase proud like he lands on his head at one point the somersault to shoot him is also very good like this is very silly but it's kind of what i want out of a movie like this uh uh-huh. it reminded me of john ritter in that movie real men the only good movie that jim belushi ever made 
I think both of those things are true. That's a weird movie, but I really liked it. I haven't watched it in decades, but I remember it being so quirky and odd and John Ritter, it just played to his physical comedic abilities. Mm -hmm. And Jim Belushi is the straight man. Yeah. Because he's not a funny person at all. And he does that very well in that film. The whole glass of water thing and all that stuff. It's very strange. Yeah. But yeah, so the plane <laughs> gets moving. And Wesley Snipes asks Chief Biggs, Hey, can you drive me alongside that plane, baby? Because I'm going to get back on board. And the Chief gets him in a car. And Wesley Snipes, in a tasty bit of patter, is like, I said, get me close to that plane, baby. I thought all you cornbread, buttermilk, white bastards knew how to drive a car yeah. uh-huh cracker honky something maybe. yeah like, yeah and he's like well you just hold on to your hat there boy because i will take you close to this your this plane me ain't never been told i don't do it like that since me was in high school and also wesley Sipes is like you got a gun baby yeah i got one right here this is my wife gun so you better bring it back to me in good condition or else i'm gonna be whoo he in the doghouse which is bizarre because he gives him the gun uh-huh and then Wesley Snipes, he clearly did some level of stunt work for this because there are close shots of Wesley Snipes hanging out of this car next to something that looks like a moving airplane. Yeah. But as he jumps onto the landing gear, the gun just pops out of his pocket onto the ground. The callback to the gun is immediate where yeah. he doesn't have this gun tucked into his belt for what, 15 seconds before it's it on the tarmac? Back. Yeah. On board, Rain. He's licking his fingertips. He's kind of stalking behind Marty. He's like, how about you get me a drink? I'll have mm. anything wet. Did you enjoy yourself in the lower galley with Wesley Snipes? It's a tight little place. Tell me, Marty, did he get in your tight little place? And she just slaps his face and says, you'll have to kill me first if you think you're going to have sex with me. And then Charles Rain says, no, Marty, I plan to kill you during. I'm like, so he's going to kill her while he has sex with her? Yeah, I think that's the implication. Isn't that what that succubus did in that Faust movie you had me watch? Probably. She killed that guy when she was having sex with him? That was gross. Yeah. That movie was gross. I still feel funky about watching that one that never goes away let me just dispel that idea right now <laughs> hepatitis faust also all this talk of marty is like you haven't gone crazy on me have you cosmo i could never shoot my friend marty shoot my friend marty wesley snipes climbs back into the plane he's in the luggage area and he peeks around he sees henchman hawk Ca -ca! who's unpacking something or maybe also looking for his own cool leather jacket and wesley snipes walks up behind him and these two start beating each other up with some punching and kicking somehow a golf club shows up at one point to serve as a replacement for nunchucks or katana swords and this whole thing ends with wesley snipes crushing henchman hawk's head with a large storage container it's all right also this is another wesley snipes move that we're going to see a lot of in the back end of this movie he hits hawk in the balls with this putter at least three times uh-huh what was the movie where invasion usa where richard lynch kept shooting everybody in the dick it's like wesley yeah. snipes went to the genital trauma school of fighting and just time check for what it's worth we got about five minutes left in this movie we're so close to the end you can see it wesley snipes climbs up some sort of escape hatch or like travel tunnel that's in the plane and he pops up yeah he's in the cockpit it's like a peewee's playhouse secret door or something he's like hey everybody it's me wesley snipes and they're like hey what are you doing down there the co-pilot says you're in charge nailed it what are you talking about baby and then he climbs out of this thing he says hey baby i'm one of the good guys turn this plane around and take it back to the airfield we just left baby can you do that good you dig it awesome and then here charles rain sees that something's wrong as the plane is turning around and he says elizabeth hurley go to the cockpit and see what's up so she walks up you're in charge what are you talking about who told you to turn this plane around and wesley snipes just pops out of nowhere and he says i told him baby and then bonk he hits elizabeth hurley on the head out she goes uh-huh and then wesley snipes says i've only got one more terrorist to take care of baby land this plane so he goes into the back and he and charles rain just start karate fighting punching and kicking and one of them's got a gun from somewhere a bullet blows open a window Window, like in Goldfinger, oxygen masks fall down, and then the pressure in the cabin starts to depressurize. And Charles Rain at one point starts to strangle Wesley Snipes with some of the plastic tubes from the oxygen mask. Yeah, it's pretty good. And <laughs> Marty sees like the bulkhead door 
start to bend and then it just blows open yep this is the cue for wesley snipes to just start hitting charles rain in the balls over and over again which calls back to the beginning of the movie where i thought maybe he doesn't feel any pain like he's incapable of feeling this man karate punching his testicles over and over and over again i guess i grazed one of my testicles with the dryer door the other day and i was down for three hours but that's honestly i think worse than actually being hit hit in the balls is the graze if you think having wesley snipes pummel your ball sack like a speed bag i want you to say worse. that again slower. just a nut graze come on oh, that sounds all right then he kicks charles rain in the balls all the way to the door of this blade uh-huh. at which point rain is like hanging on to the sides of the doors lest he go plummeting out of the plane and then wesley snipes gives him a change up by kicking him in the balls one more time and then in the face uh-huh. and it's the the face that does the job and sure enough he goes flying out into the night sky yeah just disappears into the clouds and it looks a lot like hans gruber yeah falling. for sure <laughs> but look this movie knows where the bread's buttered so wesley sipes goes to the cockpit and radios the tower he's like hey we're, we're turning the plane around baby and the tower's like well what about Charles Rain, did you take care of him? Wesley Snipes gives his signature line of the movie, in, by which I mean he only uses it one time, where he says, you damn skippy. That old white woman does lead a woof, woof, woof when he walks through to reinforce her racist tendencies. It, yeah, and gets the whole plane on board with casual racism, which is fun. <laughs> the other thing that's crazy is when he's on the phone with Tom Sizemore, and Tom Sizemore says, hey, it's your pal Sly, what's your status? And he says, single, but I'm working on on it as he looks at marty with some real fuck eyes mm -hmm. and then the plane lands yeah the remaining hostages get off elizabeth hurley again who the movie reminds you was in this film she gets put into the back of a police cruiser and then wesley snipes and marty they get off the plane and i think they're just heading over toward the county fair yeah i'm sure on the plane he was like listen i gotta tell you baby i stole some popcorn <laughs> earlier that was delicious and i got a gander at a couple of the cows and chickens in the livestock tent and i really kind of want to circle back around to that and see if my eyes deceive me or if those were some fine examples of husbandry also baby they've got a thing over there it's a corn dog wrapped inside a waffle inside of a pizza i don't know what they call it but i call it delicious i call it a first date yeah so they're just wandering off it's Tom Sizemore runs and, and tracks him down and is like, hey, what am I supposed to do? Like, where are you guys going? We've got press to deal with and all kinds of stuff. And Wesley Snipes is like, that's all you, baby. I'm not touching any of that. I'm going to go throw up on the tilt a whirl I'm going to get a whiplash on the whiplash. <laughs> anyway, so Tom Sizemore, once again, this friend that got him the job, was constantly asking for his well-being, is just shoved roughly to the side. And given no shrift at all in this movie, as Wesley Snipes mm -hmm. is like, I've got potentially another pretty lady on my arm. So thanks for nothing, Sly. And just takes off. And so Sizemore goes to tell the reporters like, oh, well, this is actually a counterterrorism program that was a rousing success if you ignore all the people that got shot on this plane. And all the dead police officers that showed up in response to yeah. this terrorist attack. Right. The, a rousing success. They've, <laughs> By my count, there are at least like seven or eight innocent dead bodies here and that still seems pretty high i guess the it's, it's a could have been worse scenario that they the explosion that was referenced by bruce greenwood didn't happen but it's so hard to prove a negative wesley snipes and marty they walk off towards the intoxicating bouquet of fried foods from the carnival and then chief biggs rolls up and he says ho ho he ho he's like wesley snipes you need to go work out there hey you got the gun what belong to my wife i ain't going to get into the dog house and Wesley Snipes says, hey, baby, the gun's somewhere over on the tarmac. Your boys will find it, I'm sure. I lost it somewhere. I mean, do you see what I'm doing here? He even says, like, well, you know, the closest town from here is like 30 miles. That's fine. We're walking. I would rather walk for the rest of the night and into the day. <laughs> Then get into the back of this patrol car. Right. <laughs> with this racist Southern sheriff. Yeah. The last line of the movie is Wesley Snipes saying, Good night, Biggs. And then fireworks go off over the fair. Uh -huh. End of movie. And then Stevie Wonder oh, it's a starts singing Too High. Yeah. 
A song about drug abuse. I don't care what it's about. It's a great song, and the fact that Stevie Wonder shows up in this movie at all is a welcome sight. And that's Passenger 57, which I don't even know why it's called. All right, just, all right. So, but, 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 so Bo, we've done Die Hard on a Train. We've done Die Hard on a Plane. Uh-huh. On a Mountain on the Ice. Uh-huh. On a Cruise Ship. That was nice. <laughs> Where should our Die Hard finale be? How about we get Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery? That's right. Our season finale of season 19, Die Hard Ons, will be The Rock. And no, I'm not talking about 30 Rockefeller Plaza. I'm talking about Alcatraz, the famed prison in San Francisco Bay, which is also a set piece for a whole bunch of movies, including this Michael Bay Spectacular. I am horrified. Ed Harris is our Hans Gruber. Yeah. Sort of. Sort but he's, of. Yeah, but he has noble intentions. He's kind of like the Sandman from that third Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire. Yeah. You know, his heart's in the right place. Execution mm, needs a little polish. Uh, aside from being one of the longer movies we're going to cover in this season, it's appropriate yeah. for the finale because it is almost front to back nonsense. <laughs> and it has Sean Connery. Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. In my estimation i i'm not a michael bay fan never have been never will be well who is but oh they're out there chad <laughs> they're out there but if you want to make more movies featuring those two actors i'm totally fine with that would you be okay if they made more movies with nicholas cage and sean connery but they computer generated sean connery like they did that dead ghostbuster in that most recent ghostbusters movie i think all of that should be banned recreating dead actors in movies yeah it doesn't look like real carrie fisher or peter cushing carrie fisher they did it with orville redenbacher in a popcorn commercial a few years ago but he looked real weird here's the thing that nobody <laughs> has told filmmakers at large yet is that i know that cgi is really good but it still doesn't look real you know, maybe landscapes and panoramas and that kind of thing, but human beings that are completely CGI creations still look fake. And it's really unsettling and incredibly distracting in a movie, and I hate it. They did that recently on that uh, Book of Boba Fett show where they did a CGI Luke Skywalker, and it mm -hmm. made me burn my television. I thought it was haunted. <laughs> Do you like it when they de-age people like they did Kurt Russell in Guardians of the Galaxy 2? They did it with Johnny Depp in that fifth Pirates of the Caribbean. I think that's better than the whole cloth creation. I'm still not in favor of any of it, but that's better than most it's better than just like oh we're gonna completely recreate peter cushing based on apparently a child's drawing of peter cushing i think it's also that your brain knows they're dead and you're like that's not them like ah oh, what is that it's that but it's also how it looks it's just it's too plastic still and i have that feeling about most computer graphics like very rarely do you see cgi in a movie that doesn't still feel like it's just animated as opposed to a real thing we're not there yet. Well, for our next movie, there's none of that. This thing is chock full of practical effects and Michael Bay brand explosions. Lots of red, white, and blues. It's going to be fantastic. Which we've done one Michael Bay movie previously. We did Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. Yeah. I mean, that's bad I think that's all I've done. So we'll be revisiting his brand of filmmaking that Bo claims there are people out there that thoroughly enjoy from beginning to end. So as always, like, rate, review. You can email us at pick6movies at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Bo, do you have any final thoughts on Passenger 57? You're in charge. Oh, damn it. <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks, everybody.